Welcome back, everyone, for lecture six. Here we're going to start talking about Newton's laws of motion. Okay, and Newton's greatest accomplishments came about during the plague a few hundred years ago when he was isolated and just got to think. Can you imagine being without a phone and being isolated? I believe he was isolated with his mother. So how good could that be? Anyway, so we're going to discuss Newton's laws. Um, let me just say say something I mentioned in an earlier lecture. Remember when we talked about an object when we let go and it falls because we're all so smart? And we said, why does it fall? And we said, yes, because of gravity. And then we said, well, what is gravity? Well, it's an attract. Well, if we really think about how the Earth talks to this eraser, makes something fall, the answer is we don't know. But and Newton didn't figure it out. But the important thing is we never thought about it. We never in our lives thought about what gravity is. Newton with the story, with the apple, he thought about it and that's what made him so brilliant. Incredible. All right, so let's start talking about Newton's laws of motion. And gotta tell you, they're not that hard. Before I discuss Newton, let me say one other thing. In the Western white world, before Newton was the laws of Aristotle. Aristotle was a few thousand years BC, and Aristotle had his explanation for natural phenomena. So for example, according to Aristotle, if you threw a rock into the air, where does the rock end up? Well, the rock goes and eventually ends up back on the ground. Why does, the, why does the rock go back to the ground? Well, Aristotle would say a rock is solid, the earth is solid, and so the rock simply goes back to its proper place. And if I make a fire, where does the smoke go? When you make a fire, the smoke goes up in the air. Why? Well, smoke is a gas, air is a gas, and so the smoke simply goes to its proper place. So this was science for a few thousand years the philosophy of Aristotle until the time of Newton and Galileo when we started to quantify, when we started to uh, put numbers and make predictions about things. And in fact, the scientific revolution uh, during that time, scientists became very arrogant because they were able to predict how long a projectile would be in the air and where it would land. They said, well, it's already determined by, you know, we could figure it out. So. If that's determined, then everything in the universe is determined. So there's no God. There's no free will. Everything's already determined. So scientists uh, got in a little bit of trouble with the church. All right, let's not get into trouble. Let's just get back to Newton, okay? All right, let's talk about his first law. His first law, I'm just going to summarize. It's all in the book. It's in every book. I'm just going to call it uniform motion, okay? Okay, now uniform is going to be not accelerating. Okay, not accelerating. So what is this law of uniform motion? Again, it's so simple, but nobody ever said it. So let, let's just see what Newton said. Newton said an object in uniform motion, not accelerating, will remain in uniform motion forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. And ever. So you do something to it. So if a rocket ship is traveling at 20,000 miles per hour through space, if it goes near no planets, no galaxies, no black holes, 20,000 miles per hour in a million years, you know what that rocket will be doing? According to Newton, still traveling at 20,000 miles per hour. Now, if I take this eraser and I place it on a table, in this, rest, in this frame, it's not moving, not accelerating. So if I place this eraser sitting there, see, beautiful. If I place this on the table and come back in 10 years, guess what? If no one touches it, the eraser is still there. So Newton's first law says, remember, not moving is zero acceleration also. So Newton's first law says an object in uniform motion, not accelerating, will remain excuse me, remain in uniform motion forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever unless you do something to it. Do something to it is the second law, okay? So let's look at the second law. 
And once again, the second law is very, 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 very simple. Okay? Here's what the second law says. Suppose that I have an object and has a certain mass. Now, what are we going to measure mass in? Well, in a metric system, we're going to me measure mass in kilograms, right? Thousand grams, thousands of grams. Now, unless you're dealing drugs, most of us don't deal with kilograms every day, right? Now, if I convert a kilogram to the units we use in this country, first of all, what units do we use for mass in this country, this country being the United States? What units of mass? Now, you get on a scale, you look at yourself, and what do you do? You're weighing yourself, and what does it say? Well, unless you're really heavy, it'll say something that you're pretty pleased with, and it'll say, give an answer in pounds. But pounds is your weight. Later today, we'll see that weight and mass are not the same. In the United States, mass is measured in something called a, this is a great one, this is called a slug. Mass is measured in slugs. Can you imagine going up to someone saying, you know, you're putting on a few slugs. You know what they'll do? They'll slug you. All right, so our unit of mass is going to be a kilogram. If we convert this, just so we have an order of magnitude, so we have an idea what a kilogram is. If we convert it to the units we're used to in measuring weight in this country, one kilogram is approximately 2.2 .2 LBS pounds, okay? They're not the same unit we're converting, okay? So a kilo is a little over two pounds. All right, so let's look at the second one. Gonna watch. Suppose I have an object of certain mass. Okay, can everybody see? Can you see? Suppose I hit it. What does it do? Well, its speed goes from zero to something else. Let's ignore the fact that it stops. Why does it stop? You and I know it's because of friction. Let's ignore friction. I take an object, I hit it, it accelerates. Oops! And I really accelerate it. Now, I hit it, it accelerates. I hit it, it accelerates. I hit it, it accelerates, right? I'll do this for a half hour, so go take a break. No, I hit it, it accelerates. What if I hit it twice as hard? What if I hit the object twice as hard? What do you think happens to the acceleration? Correct, twice as great. Now, take the object, I hit it five times greater. What happens to the acceleration? You agree? Five times greater. Now, I take the object and I hit it 100 times, oops, there it goes, 100 times greater. What is the acceleration? The acceleration is then 100 times greater. So if I hit it 100 times harder, the acceleration is 100 times greater. So let's see what we just said. The acceleration is directly proportional to how hard I hit it. How do you write that, how hard I hit it? Well, we're going to call how hard I hit it the force. Okay? Let me go get the eraser. Okay? So, back to our equation. Acceleration is directly proportional. The greater the force, the greater the object accelerates. Fantastic. Now suppose I hit it, it accelerates. I hit it, it accelerates. I hit it, it accelerates. Got it? Suppose now I hit it exactly the same, but now I put two erasers there. Now I hit it, what happens to the acceleration? Well, if I have twice the mass, common sense tells us the acceleration will be less. How much less? Twice as small, or well, one half is great. If I put 10 times the mass and hit it the same, the acceleration should be one tenth. So what we're saying is the greater the mass, the greater the mass, the smaller the acceleration. The greater the force, the greater the acceleration. So I'm going to rewrite this in terms of symbols. A equals F over M. Can everybody see? Now if I solve for F, the force, F equals MA. 
Now, a lot of times this is the way we see Newton's laws written. I will explain. Or we'll fix this up in one second, okay? But what I really want to do is I want to look at the units of force. Remember, physics, chemistry, these are the hard sciences. We need numbers. I cannot say, boy, I hit that really hard. No, I got to say how hard. What units? And then give it a number, okay? But we already have numbers, units, okay? We said mass is in kilograms. Does anyone remember, do you remember what our units of acceleration are? Same units we use for the acceleration due to gravity, right? Acceleration is meters per second squared. So this is our unit of force. Cool. Unit of force. So now, now I could say, wow, I hit that with a 20 kilogram meter per second squared force. That rocket ship was projected upward with a force of 800,000 kilogram meters per second squared. <gasps> By the time I say that, I'm out of breath. So instead of saying kilogram meters per second squared every time, we give this unit a name. What do we call it? We call it a Mancini. No, no, we don't. We give this name, we call it a Newton. Okay? So now I could say, I whacked that eraser with a force of 50 newtons, 300 newtons, 117.2 newtons, okay? So that's our unit of force, a newton. Now, I said this equation, this is the way people usually write it, but it's not exactly true. It's true, but not exactly. It's a little subtle. I'll get back to this in one second. First of all, I want to say this. Suppose we write F equals MA. The force is mass times acceleration. I'll fix it in a second. What if A is equal to G, the acceleration due to gravity? So what I'm saying is F equals mg. What are the units now? G is still in acceleration. M is still kilograms. This is still in newtons. But now, what are we saying? This is the force due to gravity, isn't it? Force due to gravity. We have a name for this force due to gravity. This is called the weight. So you see, weight is a force, right? Kilograms is a mass. Mass is not a force. So when an astronaut goes very far into outer space, we say they are weightless. Why are they weightless? Because the force of gravity is so small, virtually nil, that there's no force on it. So they're weightless. They feel no force. But does that mean they are massless? No, they are not. They still have a mass. You still have your mass. So the weight is mass times acceleration due to gravity, okay? Now, I said this formula needs to be modified a little bit, okay? So let, let me draw a picture. And let's suppose I take my eraser and I put it on a table. This is a table, okay? And this is my eraser. Now, the eraser is sitting on the table. Is it accelerating? Well, the answer is no, not in this frame. It has zero acceleration. If it has zero acceleration, what's the force? Force is zero. But I have to be careful. It doesn't mean that there's no forces acting on it, right? Does this eraser still have a weight? The answer is yes. Of course, the, the earth is still pulling down on it. So I'm going to erase this and draw this. Watch. The weight equal to mg is pulling down. Is the eraser accelerating? The answer is no. Why isn't it accelerating? Well, again, this is so obvious. Why? Because the table, I'm going to put force of table, is acting up. So the acceleration equals zero. So what I need to write is this, F total 
equals MA. Does everybody understand that? In this picture, it's clear the table is pushing up with the same force of, of the uh, weight of the object. So here, F table equals the weight MG. And they cancel out. So the total force is MA. If A is zero, the total force is zero. If the total force is zero, that does not mean there are zero forces acting. It means the total force. So let's, let's use an example. When you're in your car, suppose you have cruise control on your car. My car is very old. I don't have fancy cruise control. So you know what I have? On my pedal, on my gas pedal, I have different bricks I put on. So I have a brick that's 50 miles an hour, 60, 60, different weighted bricks because it's an old car. But suppose you're going at a constant 50 miles an hour. Constant speed. If your speed is constant, then your change in speed with time is zero. So you have zero acceleration. If your acceleration is zero, then the total force acting on the car is zero. It doesn't mean zero forces. It means the total force. So what's projecting the car forward is the thrust, the motor, the thrust of the car going this way. Is anything going this way to cancel it, the opposite way? The answer is, of course, yes. There's resistance of the tires, friction. And there's wind resistance, you see? So when the thrust of the car exactly equals the resistive force, the total force is zero. Does that mean your car stops? No, it just means your car stops accelerating and you move at a constant speed. If you step on the accelerator, you have a greater force, then you overcome the resistive force, now you accelerate. If you take your foot off the accelerator and slow down, the resistive force acts, and you have a net deceleration. The same is true for raindrops. You remember when I said, you know, raindrops fall from 10,000 feet, and if we go outside, we don't go, ah, we're dying because the raindrops don't go right through our head because every second they're falling, uh, and they're, they're, their speed is increasing by 10 meters per second every second. No, what happens is eventually air resistance is equal to the weight of the drop, and what happens is it falls at a constant speed. That's called terminal velocity, terminal velocity or terminal speed. For a human being, you jump out of a window. If you fall like this, less air resistance. If you fall like this, greater air resistance. But in general, uh, I, I believe terminal speed for a human being is about 120, 130 miles an hour. So imagine jumping out of a window and you land on the cement like this at 130 miles per hour. Well, on TV, when you see these detective shows, the person's just laying there. Really, in real life, you fall at that speed, the person would be laying there and here and there and splattered all over the place. Okay? So, total force is equal to mass times acceleration. Okay? Now, again, this must be in kilograms, this must be in meters, and it must be per second squared, okay? Kilogram meters per second squared. Fantastic. All right, so that's Newton's second law. So let me write this here. Newton's laws. One, uniform motion. And two, we said F total equals MA. Again, if we're talking about the force of gravity, A would be G, and we'd be talking about the weight. But the total force is mass times acceleration. Okay? Third law, this is the law called action-reaction. Okay? Okay? What does that mean? Very simple, very simple in principle, okay? If I push on this board with all my might and put a force on it, guess what? The board pushes back on me. So if I push the board with a force of 100 newtons, the board pushes back on me with 100 newtons. When I walk, 
If I want to force that way, my feet have to push on the ground, push that way. The equal and opposite reaction is that I project forward. In outer space, I cannot walk. There's nothing to push against. Okay? Action, reaction. Fantastic. All right. Let's finish off the chapter. Let's discuss something called centripetal force. And then I'll show you the types of problems I'll ask. I'll give you some examples. Centripetal force. Okay. <sighs> Centripetal, the word means center seeking. Okay. He's trying to pull you towards the center. So let's imagine I have a rock at the end of a string. Right? We all know the story about the little guy with the giant. Right? And the giant's coming to kill him. What is that? David and Goliath. But they don't tell you that David's sister was on the side. And so... She was a cheerleader in high school, and she's saying, go, David, go, kill that giant, kill that monster, right? And the monster's coming, coming closer, and David's got the rock. He's got the rock. He's swinging it. He's swinging it. And just as the monster's right over here, right in front, he takes the rock. The rock is right here, and he lets go of the string. What happens? Well, the rock continues tangentially, keeps going, and his sister's over there. Go, David, go, go, kill that monster. The rock comes. And he kills his sister. See, they didn't put that in the Bible. So if he wants to kill a giant coming towards him over there, what should Davy have done? He should have let go of the rock here. So let's see what we're saying. Imagine we have a string. I'll say there's a tension there. Let's say it's going around like this. This is my rock. Okay. At this instant, if I let go, the rock, the rock goes off tangentially okay right here the rock goes off there here goes off there you see every place it wants to go off like that you see how come it doesn't keep going because it gets pulled back in gets pulled back in towards the center and that's because of the tension in the string if this is the earth and that's the sun, the force pulling it in towards the center is not a string. It's the force due to gravity. Okay? So imagine, again, use your imagination. Suppose you're in a car and you're going in a circle. Your friend's driving in a circle. You know you feel a force. You know the faster they go in a circle, the greater the force. So suppose they're going at 30 miles an hour in a circle. You feel a certain force. Suppose they go 30 miles an hour, but they make a circle that's five miles long in radius. Well, then, the same speed, you feel less of a force. The smaller the radius, 30 miles an hour, the greater the force you feel. Okay? So what we're saying is the force... I'll put circle here, but I'll explain. Circle has an L. Imagine that. Depends on, we all agree it depends on how fast you're going, right? The faster you go, the greater the force. So I'm going to put a V here. And we all agree that if the radius of the circle gets bigger, you feel less of a force. So we'd say it's inversely proportional. See here, we'll put radius here. Now, you don't need to know this. I, this is not the equation, but I want you to see something. Remember what force? Force is in newtons. Remember, it's kilogram, right? Meters per second squared. So I'm going to put your mass here, and then we have velocity over radius. Okay? Well, if I put this in, the units would be kilograms. Right? This would be meters per second, and this would be meters. If 
I just write this, mv over r, we get kilogram meters per second per meters. The meters would go out, and I'd have kilograms per second. Kilograms per second is not the correct units. Okay? If I do this, if I square the speed, watch this. Now I have meters squared. I'm going to put m squared seconds squared over meters. So now one of the meters goes out, and now I have kilogram. Did I do that right? Meters squared. Yes, kilogram. Kilogram. Meters go out per second squared. That's the correct units for a Newton. This force going in a circle is called the centripetal, center-seeking force. So watch what I write. F sub C. What does C stand for? Centripetal. Equals M V squared over R. What are the units of centripetal force? Well, force is always in kilogram meters per second squared. So this is a newton. Okay. Now watch. Here's a problem I'll ask. Problem number one. If the mass... No. Okay, is doubled while the speed is quadrupled. Everybody know what that means? Multiply by four. What happens to the centripetal force? So let's see what happens. Let's see. So watch. F sub C equals the mass M V squared over R. Okay. So what are we doing to the mass? I say the mass is doubled. So what am I doing? Instead of M, I'm putting 2M. Double, double the mass. Okay. What am I doing to V? V, I'm quadrupling. So that means I'm making it 4V, but I have to square 4V. So what do you get? You get 2 times 4 squared is 16 times mv squared over r. So the answer is 32 mv squared over r. So it's increased 32 times. See? Let's do another one. Suppose we have the uh, speed is doubled while the radius is halved. So what happens to the centripetal force? Okay. Mass is staying the same. The speed is doubled, so it's 2v, but I have to square that. What am I doing to the radius? I'm making it half r. So this becomes 2 squared is 4 divided by a half, and then we have mv squared over r. What's 4 divided by 2? If I have $4, how many half dollars are in there? Well, it's equal to 8. So this is 8 mv squared over r. So we'd say it's increased 8 times. This is the type of problem I would ask on an exam. Okay? Good. One last topic to get out of this chapter. Oh, watch this. Let's finish with this first. Let's let's centripetal force F C 
is equal to mv squared over r. Now remember, force is ma. So I'm going to say that's m sub a sub c. That's the centripetal acceleration. F equals ma. So the a here, a sub c, is just v squared over r. Okay? And once again, if I double the speed, have the radius, quadruple the speed, double the radius, whatever, that would be a problem I would ask on an exam. Finally, let's talk about Newton's universal law of gravitation. So this is the law that governs the stars, the planets, keeps us in motion around the sun, and so forth. Okay? As I said, Newton figured this out. He wrote it, but he never understood what gravity was. Okay? So I'm going to just give it to you, tell you what it is. I'm going to write F gravity is equal to, I'm going to write a big G. We will not deal with this G, but I'll tell you about it. The mass of one object, the mass of the other object, divided by the distance squared. So, watch this. And I want you to pay attention to this. Note, the square. It's the square inverse. This is called an inverse square law. Okay? This G is a constant. We will not be dealing with it. You don't need it. But it's on the order of 10 to the minus 11. That's a really small number. It's really small. So let's look at this m1, m2 over d squared, OK? Suppose I have an object m1. Here's an object m2. And this is the distance d. What is m1? What is m2? Well, m1 could be this eraser. M2 could be a chair on the other side of the room. M1 could be this envelope. M2 could be a taxi on Madison Avenue. M1 could be the Earth. M2 could be Pluto. M1 could be me. M2 could be you. We're attracted. So Newton's law says every two objects in the universe are attracted. In fact, if I take this object and I wiggle it, every atom in every object not only in this room and in my body, but every object in the universe feels it. We're all connected. Very Buddhist idea, right? We're all connected. So if I take an object or I shake myself, if I wiggle, then every atom in your body eventually feels that wiggling. Is it a big force? No. You can never measure it. But not the point. We're all connected. So when I shake this object, this, this eraser, every rock on the moon feels it. So be careful. When you think you're alone in the bathroom and nobody knows what you're doing, every atom in the universe knows what you're doing. So be careful. All right, so M1 is a, is a, a desk. M2 is a book. Doesn't matter. D is the separation. If I double the distance, if I, two objects go twice as far away, what happens to the force? Well, you'd want to say it's one half as great, but it's not. I'm going to leave the G out. I'm going to say F of gravity goes like, forget the G, M1, M2 over the distance squared. Now watch, distance squared. If I double a distance, that means I make it not D, but 2D. 2D, but I have to square that. 1 over 2 squared becomes 1 fourth the force. Do you see that? If you go 10 times farther away, the force is not one-tenth as great. It's one one-hundredth as great. So if I make this 10 times the distance, 10 squared would be 1 over 100. What if two objects get five times closer? Five times closer means the distance is one-fifth. 
Now, huh, fractions. Go review your fractions. One divided by one fifth squared is the same as one over one over twenty five, five squared. Now, if you multiply, now, first of all, let's do this. Can I multiply this by 1? Of course I can. Multiplying by 1 doesn't do anything. So watch this. 1 over 1 over 25 times, do you agree 25 divided by 25 is 1, right? So in the numerator, 25 times 1 is 25. In the denominator, I have 25 over 25, 25 over 25, which is just 1. So this is 25 over 1. So 1 over 1 over 25 is 25. You need to review. So one last thing. Here's my problem here. What happens to the gravitational force If both masses are doubled, oops, doubled while their separation is halved. Okay, so let's see. We have F goes like, forget the G, M1, M2 over D squared. Remember, this is what we have. We don't need the G. So each mass is doubled. That means I'm making that twice the mass twice the mass. And what am I doing to the separation? It's half. So I'm making D one half, but I have to square that. So in the numerator, we get two times two, we get four. In the denominator, we get one fourth. So this is saying, if you have $4, how many quarters are in $4? Well, the answer is 16 times. So the answer would be increased, increased, by 16 times, 4 divided by 1 fourth. So this, again, would be a typical test question. All right, I think that's all the subjects, all the topics in Chapter 2. And the next chapter will be energy, and we'll cover that in the next lecture.